Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Karen Sherry. I'm one of the curators at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And I want to welcome you all to tonight's program, Hidden Figure of GPS, a conversation with Gla Dr. Gladys West. This is one of the many virtual programs the museum is offering during these days of pandemic and, and staying at home and also um, more recently, very bad weather. Uh, so I hope you're all staying safe and warm. And um, as I say, this is one of many programs we have online. Uh, we do various lectures. We have a movie myth busting program, behind the scenes tours and so forth. So please check out our website at virginiahistory.org to see um, many of the other exciting things we've got going on at the museum. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, and thank you all for your patience. We had a few technical difficulties, so we're starting a few minutes late. We apologize for that. Um, but are so glad that you're here with us tonight for this really special program that um, is celebrating a great trailblazer. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to our members. The VMHC is a private nonprofit, which means that we don't get support from the state or from the municipal government. So we really rely on the generosity of members and other supporters. So thank you very much to you. Uh, I also want to give a shout out um, to my two behind the scenes helpers for this program. Um, Carolyn Oglesby, who is Dr. West's daughter and has been immensely helpful in um, uh, making this program happen. So thank you, Carolyn. And also a thanks to my colleague, Haley Fenner, who is one of the educators at the museum. And she's kind of our tech guru. She's, she's running the show from behind the scenes. She's also avail available if you're having any tech support. Um, if you can just um, write a message in the chat box and Haley will do her best to help you. So thanks to Carolyn and Haley. Uh, one more housekeeping note before we get started. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. West, um, anytime they occur to you during the program, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box um, rather than the chat box, because we'll be monitoring the Q&A box for questions and we'll be able to direct your questions to Dr. West during that portion of tonight's program. All right, so. Um, let's get on with the um, formal part of tonight's program. Um, you um, might wonder, be wondering who, who is Dr. Gladys West. Even if you don't know her, though, you have certainly benefited from her work because Dr. West is a, a hidden figure of GPS. She is a mathematician who helped transform modern life through um, her work on GPS and other important technology during a 40 plus year career at the Naval Surface Warfare Center in, in Dahlgren in the Northern Neck of Virginia. When she began at Dahlgren in 1956, she was one of the first four black professionals to be hired there um, and uh, was one of only two women at the time. One of the other black professionals was her husband, Ira West, um, whom she met and married um, uh, a year after she began. And, and you can see both Gladys and, and Ira in the photo on the screen now. Now, um, when Dr. West was born in the 1930s, uh, most people would not have envisioned her having such an accomplished career because she was a black girl who grew up poor and in a rural community in Virginia. This was during the Great Depression and the era of Jim Crow segregation. Um, and she grew up in Dinwiddie County. But um, Gladys Brown, uh, as she was born, knew from a young age that she wanted more from life than uh, life on a farm. And she also knew that education was the key to um, more opportunity. 
Um, and she really committed herself to her studies and became valedictorian of her segregated high school, which earned her a scholarship to Virginia State University, one of Virginia's five historically black colleges and universities. Um, she graduated from there in 1952 uh, in mathematics and um, in 1955 earned a master's from VSU. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, she, she took a couple years of teaching, but then in 1956, she was recruited to join um, what was then called the Naval Proving Ground at Dahlgren. And that's when she started at Dahlgren. Uh, that was the beginning of a really distinguished 42 year career. And this was also a really um, a historic moment because this was at the beginning of the satellite age, uh, something I think we maybe take for granted today, but it was really in its infancy in the mid 1950s. It was also at the height of the Cold War with a great deal of competition between the United States and the Soviet Union over military and technological supremacy. Um, and here's a map. Uh, where you can see where Dahlgren is still located today um, in the Northern Neck. Here's a photo of Dr. West um, during her career and a page from one of the reports she authored. Um, I'm a historian. I don't understand the math or science behind uh, Dr. West's work, but um, she did work on coding and programming for some of the world's first supercomputers. She also helped develop the technology that turned into global positioning system, GPS, something many of us use every day as we're just navigating around with our uh, cell phones. Um, and she worked on other technologies related to satellites and mapping the Earth's surface. Um, she retired from Dahlgren in 1998, but that did not slow her down. Um, in 2000, um, she became Dr. West. She earned a PhD in public administration from Virginia Tech. She had started um, her, her degree while she was still working full time at Dahlgren, but completed it in 2000. She also traveled and got involved in various other activities. Now, like many hidden figures, um, and uh, I, I use that phrase from Margot Lee Shetterly's book um, about um, the unacknowledged black women who, who worked in NASA. Uh, there, uh, there was also the uh, Hollywood film based on that book. Um, and like those other hidden figures, Dr., for Dr. West, recognition of her accomplishments and her contributions came very late in life. Um, but, but it's never too late for that happily. In 2008, um, as documented in one of the photographs now on the screen, she became the first black woman inducted into the Air Force Space and Missile Pioneers Hall of Fame. Uh, and I'll give just a couple of her other awards and recognitions. She was also inducted into the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame. She was recognized in the Library of Virginia's seventh annual Strong Men and Women in Virginia History. And she was also recognized um, in a special bill um, passed by Virginia's General Assembly. And you can see her getting congratulated for that below. More recently, Dr. West and her husband, Ira, Re Ira West, established the Ira and Gladys West Scholarship Fund to support Virginia students st seeking STEM careers. And she wrote her autobiography, It Began With a Dream, which was published in 2020. Uh, and signed copies of that autobiography are available on, on the museum's online shop. Um, so you can go to our website for that. Now, I first had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Dr. West in 2018 when I was working on an exhibition for the museum called Determine the 400 Year Struggle for Black Equality. And Dr. West was featured in that exhibition. And um, it was such a, a pleasure to meet her and learn about her very inspiring and uh, remarkable trailblazing career, as well as her lifelong commitment to education and service. So I'm so grateful 
to her for joining us this evening to have a conversation um, and also answer questions from you. So without further ado, I um, welcome our guest of honor, <laughs> Dr. Gladys West. Good evening. Oh, um, I think Haley's going to adjust the volume for a moment so we can hear you a little better. Uh, Dr. West, you're muted, so if you could unmute so that we can hear you. Um, if you wiggle your cursor, you should have a menu pop up on your screen and there'll be a little button in my computer. It's in the lower left corner, a little button that looks like a microphone. If you want to make sure you click on that so it's not crossed out. Hey, Dr. West, it's Haley. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so at the bottom of your screen next to that microphone icon, do you see a little up arrow? little carrot icon. If you can click on that for me. Oh yeah, I think that will turn up your volume. Give me a thumbs up once you've clicked on that little carrot icon next to the your microphone button. Perfect. Okay, so you should see two things. One says select your microphone. Do you see that? Select a microphone. Um, you might have more than one option. Thanks everyone for standing by. Um, if you're like me, where you do a lot of business by video conferencing these days, one is checked. Just, the first one is there you checked. Go. Oh, there. Your microphone now. Great. I think we're good, Dr. West. I was able to hear you. Okay. So wonderful, wonderful. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to be here. <laughs> Great. Thank you for joining us. And um, I've one thing I've also learned about Dr. West is that she's become a, a bit of a rock star and she has tons of fans. We have lots and lots of people signed up for today's program. So I know I'm not the only one eager to um, uh, talk to you. Um, so I'm going to pose a few questions to Dr. West for the first portion of this program, and then we'll turn it over to audience questions. So I'd like to start, Dr. West, um, in your autobiography and, and other conversations, you've talked about how from the time you were a little girl, you just knew you wanted something different than, than life on a rural farm in Dinwiddie County, Virginia. You talked about dreaming of a big city life. Um, so I'm curious, what was the source of those feelings? Um, what or who inspired you to dream of a bigger, a different life? Yes, I guess it, there was quite a few things that inspired me. Mm -hmm. um, when you live in the country and you don't see many other people, but then all of a sudden you start to getting a little older, a little smarter or something, you get to go to the city, see a little something. And and that sort of let, let you know that you don't have to live and be just like you are, that you can change, you, you can move and, and whatever. And also we know that when we were on the farm, um, we had to work all the time. You, you, you didn't have a whole lot of time for playing all. You rise early in the morning, getting getting the work done on the farm while uh, uh, the, the, the weather isn't too hot. And, and then, you know, get up early in the morning to start and go to bed late at night. And it's a whole lot of things. And, and I, I didn't particularly like to be... Um, dirty and not pretty as I could be all the time. <laughs> I didn't like that part either. And um, just sort of, sort of feeling isolated on that, on that farm. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, 
for me, it must be something else. And so I always thought sort of deeply also. And I, I didn't think my like playing with the dolls and, and doing this kind of thing that much. I'm always thinking and studying something different and more, more advanced. And, and so I went to visit this aunt and, and I could see the streets. There were streets because we didn't have any streets where we were. We had roads, you know. And uh, so I just put that in my little bag and in the back of my head, starting to hope it ain't working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my goodness, how, how far you've come. Although I know that, um, you know, you had a, a wonderful, loving family and, and cherish them always. Um, now, um, jumping ahead to your to, to where you landed um, by following your big dreams, um, you started your career at Dahlgren in 1956. And at that time, as I mentioned, you were one of only four Black professionals there. And as a woman, you were a double minority uh, in a workplace and a field dominated by white men. Um, can you tell us a little bit about one or two memorable examples of the racism or sexism that you faced? Well, well you know, I guess we started facing it the moment we, we were accepted the job. Um, because uh, no, no uh, educated Black people you know, had been hired there. And so uh, this the EO, the head of the group that we were working with, uh, had decided that I guess he was going to be a part of the integration. And so he started hiring Black people off and on. And uh, we sort of understood that he was reaching out, trying to help. And so that makes you feel differently about him, knowing that uh, down in his heart, he's thinking that he's helping us and bringing us in and all. So you tend to act uh, uh, the way somebody who is interested in you and, and want the best for you, you sort of respond to them in that way. And you don't go around criticizing and pointing out, that, oh, he didn't do this. Um, I, I always remember uh, when you went to the bathroom in, in the ladies' room, that if, when you walked in, everybody would stop talking. You know, that, so that's no big thing, but, it, you know, it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also we had, you know, problems with, like, um, um, traveling, because at that time, every place was not uh, integrated and didn't accept Black people, people of color. So you sometimes get missed out on things because... But you know, knowing there's a problem, you don't go and go, go head on into the problem. So you find some way to get around that or work around that problem. And I always felt that, that that had a lot to do with like all the promotions you got and everything you did when you will be blocked out sometimes because of that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a question, Dr. West. Um, uh, you are a trailblazing Black female mathematician uh, who helped transform the world um, with your work on GPS and other satellite mapping technology. And while you were doing this work, did you think of yourself as a trailblazer? Did you kind of recognize the significance of the work you were doing? And did you feel a special responsibility in your role as one of the first Black females at, at, at professionals at Dahlgren? Well, well I, I always felt uh, really uh, responsible for being the best and doing the best that I could. So um, if I'm representing us, I'm representing a group, really. Of us, and I want everybody to know that uh, we are just as good, and we can do as good work, work that's as good. And so I was always very committed and dedicated to my work and very pleased 
that I had the opportunity to work on such high powered work and to be with people who were so educated and brilliant and all that, all that sort of helped, helped, helped me a lot, you know, to, to do the best I can could for, for any kind of prob problem or project, whatever. Um, and and I, I guess I didn't, I didn't feel like um, I should jeopardize anybody else's position uh, by bringing up a whole lot of problems and, and things that I know exist at some level. Um, you, you tend to do the best you can, work as hard as you can and respect you're working the people. And so everything was fairly well. I mean, you were respectful and we uh, um, and mingled with each other and, and, and all. So, but still you knew that you knew all the limitations and whatever that was like behind the scenes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we were happy, happy to be where we were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and ask one more question for me because we have a lot of audience questions coming in and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to address some of those. So um, my final question for you, Dr. West, um, and I also want to give the audience a little taste of um, some words from your autobiography. Um, I was very moved by one of the passages in your autobiography in which you describe your feelings upon being honored by the Library of Virginia's Strong Men and Women in Virginia History Program. And you write, and now I'm quoting, now I was being honored by the same Commonwealth that had once lawfully restricted my rights as a citizen through segregation and old Jim Crow. That state that had looked down on me was now looking up at me, or at least looking me in the eye and saying, thank you for your strong character, your contributions, your job well done. Thanks for never giving up on us. We are finally beginning to get it right. And that's the end of a quote. I think that's a really, really incredibly powerful and gracious statement. And um, just, um, do you think you could maybe elaborate a little bit on your feelings in that moment um, in um, finally feeling like you were getting recognition from the state that had been denied to you for a long time? Yes, it, 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 it made you feel different and, and thought of and a part of things and more. So, and you feel like, uh, I guess we're finally arriving, and, but you know that we still we got a long ways to go, but uh, at least we're beginning uh, to see everybody beyond the color of their skin. So, um, I, 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 but I always felt that I would give my best regardless of what, what was going on to give my best of myself because <clears throat> I had just respected myself that that well is to really do what I could and be who I am in spite and set, sort of like set an example for people who were treating folks differently and for some reason that was not uh, really valid kind of thing. Um, yeah, it, it was a time when, when I was proud that uh, we were being uh, looked at looked at. Well, and we all owe you a, a debt of gratitude as, as someone who helped change hearts and minds through the quality of your work and the significance of your accomplishments. So thank you. And um, I'm now going to turn to some audience questions. Remember, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box um, on your screen. Um, so here's the first question. Dr. West, I appreciated your hard work that serves the whole world. My question is, where is the GPS signal, uh, from where does the GPS signal originate? Is it from satellites or phone towers? <laughs> so a technical question for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
I, I, I don't know whether I know myself or not. <laughs> when, I, when, when I did uh, a lot of work on, we, we started with the satellites and, and the oceans uh, and those basic sources. Because uh, I did a lot in making sure that the footprint was right uh, and accurate and this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's... It, Either place, I'm sure, if you go back far enough, sort of comes together and had some contribution. All right, another question. This is from, uh, the first question was anonymous. This is from Mr. Stanley. Um, yeah, we heard how you, you started um, your studies. Uh, you fell in love with mathematics. So Mr. Stanley's question is, at what age did you realize you were good at math? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard about that question or, or thought about that question. And, and I keep answering it like, uh, I, I, I didn't really know that I was good in math uh, at all because I always did well in all the subjects I had, all the subjects. So... Um, nothing came out outward and said, well, you're good in math and you got to do that. But when I was getting ready, thinking about going to college, uh, the high school teachers uh, was trying to direct us and guide us. And so, um, you, you, know, you, you, want to, you want to be encouraged to sort of like follow that guidance if you can. And so, so they're telling me that it's hard, math is hard. And very few people can really get it and can uh, measure in it. So uh, I should measure in that because I can get better job opportunities and all kinds of good reasons of why I should measure it. And I was always uh, very organized and, and laid things out well um, and orderly and that kind of thing. So that part of math and stuff, I was really good in and know that I was different and I was good in that. Um, uh, but as far as being being like a numbers person, especially I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't recognize that, uh, but I did. I always made good grades and everything, all my, all my work. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, there's a related question about your your educational background um, from a um, um, question is, Dr. West, would you speak to your educational experience in high school and college? <laughs> well, yeah, well, well, in high, in high school, I guess I'm ashamed to tell this one, but I, I went to high school uh, from elementary school and in elementary school, I had uh, the same teacher for all seven grades. And so therefore you didn't have a whole lot of variety in, in like friends and people and, and all, all of that. And- uh, It was a one room schoolhouse, right? It was a one room yeah, schoolhouse, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. one room schoolhouse. So when you go to high school, you're just like, oh. <laughs> 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 Good. That was a challenge. Then when when a high school was a training school, um, I, I don't know what that meant so much, but training made it different from a regular high school. But anyway, we were smaller, and we always felt that we weren't as well prepared as as kids from big schools. And uh, um, it, 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 that, that's when you got to college, you, you sort of peeping and looking and seeing what other kids are doing and um, uh, how much they are playing and how much they're having a good time and all that. You, you, you know, you sort of keep an eye on it. You know, but we had to study more. We didn't, we didn't have as much fun as they did. Mm -hmm. But uh, it... it it, it was through the whole, through the whole uh, cycle, I always had to work hard and dedicate myself and be serious all the time 
So mm -hmm. I feel like I earn everything I got. <laughs> Yeah. And um, just a, a little historical note, um, when you mentioned how your school, your high school was described as vocational, and that was often the case in segregated Black schools because of historical prejudice. It was believed that Black people didn't have the intellectual capability, so they um, were trained in, um, in manual fields. Uh, they were given vocational training rather than a more classical or college preparatory type of education. So um, that very much reflects the, the prejudices under Jim Crow segregation. Uh, but let's, um, let's go to another question, a, a little education related as well um, from Mr. Kolakowski. Uh, what words of advice do you give to students today? And I know, Dr. Ressa, you love to talk to students um, and do it regularly. So what advice do you give to them, especially those students who are interested in STEM fields? Yeah. Yes. Um, we we uh, usually talk to uh, the students in lower grades. Uh, we talk to those uh, I guess they were six, seven, eight graders and all. And um, we always say to them, uh, you know, if you've already decided which areas that you're interested in, just try to pinpoint the best you can, the, the real detailed feel that you want. And then just start uh, attending all the the little programs that are being given. Uh, we have a museum that uh, often known up in Dog that always have uh, STEM programs and they're put on fairly frequently. And, uh, and somebody who maybe you see working in a field that you would like to make sure you try to talk to and get audience that find a mentor if you can. And, uh, uh, but take advantage of it while you're still young and sort of, you know, fine tune your interest to the point that uh, you can really get, get more help from other people. And they help push you and find things and tell you about it. And uh, I think it's wonderful if, if you can identify what it is that you want to. Um, now, there, there are several questions. I'm going to group many questions together um, just for the sake of efficiency, but several people are curious to hear a little bit more about the nature of your work at Dahlgren. Um, what were some of the early uh, computer programming languages you used? What was your work on GPS like? Um, and uh, this is where, you know, we get to hear from from an expert, not from me, who <laughs> doesn't know that kind of stuff. Yeah, we came to we came to Dahlgren um, um, uh, back in uh, '57, and, and uh, uh, at the same time we were coming there, um, the big computers, the large scale computers. Uh, they were they were so big that they occupied the, uh, like the first floor of a big house and, and all. And so we were hired as mathematicians because it had been understood that mathematicians would adapt easier to uh, the, the computers. And um, uh, so we had to we had to learn the language of the of the computers. And how to how to maneuver it, and uh, so we we were named being called programmers and coders, uh, and, and I think it, laying out the flow charting and all was a real big thing, and um, uh, maybe give you a ability to use all of your logic you had uh, in your mind too, and uh, so we. It, and the computers originally, when we first started, they had a um, 
a computer language. It, it, there's a language developed especially for the computer. Uh, and we have to learn that language and learn how to code and, and uh, check it out and, and get the results and pass it along to the next level. Um, uh, and then, then we had, uh, I guess, one of the 1790 was one of the later, later computers uh, uh, that came through and beginning to ha have the scientific language uh, for coding and all. And that, that turned out to be easier than who, what it was when we started. But we didn't know any better and we enjoyed what we were doing. And uh, uh, results came out just, just the same. We just have to work a little harder. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about your work on GPS and satellite mapping. Something I learned from reading your book is that the Earth is actually pear-shaped <laughs> rather than round. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you were developing the measurements to determine that. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, really, really, we were working at the very beginning uh, of that period when satellites had become popular and we could get so much more data uh, to fine tune. And so I spent most of my time fine tuning uh, the areas over water uh, to get the, the orbit correct for, for that area. And, uh, and so, it, when you fine tune and get the results within cert certain amount of accuracy, uh, then you just sort of repeat until uh, it gets pretty close to zero and you've done well enough. And so we have, it was, it's a big job in, in doing everything. Um, we, we have stations that are set up all over around the world and uh, we collect this data and then bring it back and process it through the you're doing uh, solution to equations and all that languages had described in detail for the data that we were getting. And so it was, it was a, a process that took up a lot of time and a lot, a lot of thoroughness and uh, a lot of serious thinking. And uh, so we had some of the best people the senior scientists are there to sort of keep the eye, keep the eye on the data and make sure everything was right. Um, it, 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 was, it was an interesting period. <laughs> that sounds like a big understatement <laughs> indeed. It must have been just fascinating and, and groundbreaking work. Um, we've gotten this question from a couple of audience members asking about, and, and this is a question I think that it's still very um, germane today, um, especially as many families are struggling with childcare during the pandemic. Um, several audience members want to know how you balanced your professional career with family life, because in addition to having this remarkable career, you also um, raised three lovely children. Yes, uh, <clears throat> and during, during that period too, we, we knew that uh, some of the better housekeepers and mothers and all uh, didn't have anything else to do because there were no jobs to be hired around Dahlgren. So we had, we had the whole base of people to choose from to find somebody to help. So we had uh, always at least one person was spent, uh, all day or spent, uh, the week in our house to help take care of the kids. So there was never a period when they didn't have somebody being an after. And my husband also worked at the same place that I did. And so we, were, we lived on the base, and so we were close enough to walk home for lunch and, and, just kind of, mm -hmm. and, and when we go to the doctors and things, things like that, um, depending on which one had uh, the, the, the heaviest workload at that point, 
Uh, he would go to the doctor, take his kids to the doctor. And so we switched off a lot, a lot like that. And we uh, also uh, didn't do a lot of socializing much after work. We figured we left them enough. Stayed home quite a bit. And we had, we had opportunity, opportunities to work, work uh, at school and all with them. So we were getting a fair amount of time with them too because they went to school on the day also. So we sort of, we sort of was blessed blessed in that way. You know, we also had a house uh, lady who would do all the heavy cleaning and stuff. Mm -hmm. all, all that made it easier for us to do some other things. Um. Dr. West, I'm going to um, just ask you to make sure that you are leaning close to your computer and, and speaking into your microphone because your voice is sometimes going in and out a little bit. So we want to make sure we can we can hear you well. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you make sure you're talking to your speaker, thanks. Um, so uh, another question we have. Um, what do you think is the most important life lesson that you would share with women and women of color? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I still, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I still uh, always start with the fact that uh, you yourself um, have to have certain uh, traits or characteristics too. I mean, you have to be somebody who is dedicated and want to do their best and want to help others. And um, so, so uh, start by being the right person yourself and then work with others, be respectful, be committed, uh, uh, sort of help others and, and, and be a mentor to others. You, you have a whole lot that you can sort of like give to others yourself without having to uh, expect so much. Sometimes we, we go to a job or on a job and we just expect everything from everybody else, but not from yourself. You know, so if you want to be respected, then you should respect uh, the person that you're working with or talking to, whatever, however it, it is. And uh, just uh, be be dependable. Uh, be uh, uh, just just uh, a solid rock. Be, uh, you know, committed, uh, and be and be respectful to other people, and give them the same things that you want somebody to give you. Okay. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, uh, of which professional accomplishment, uh, of your many professional accomplishments, are you most proud? Oh dear. Well, well I, you know, I get, I guess really I'm, 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 I'm most proud and sort of like getting through, getting through the process, getting through like starting ground zero and then getting to, through to the PhD. I think that process that uh, is something to, for me to be proud of because I, I had struggles and I had to work hard and all that. And then I come to the end where I sort of made it through everything, you know. So um, the, the journey is um, in its entirety. That's uh, certainly something to be very proud of. Well, um, we have a couple of questions about one of your accomplishments and, and that is earning your, your PhD. And um, as a fellow PhD holder, I know how, how much dedication and work that takes. Um, we have a question from someone who's, who's a fellow Hokie um, <laughs> and um, is, asking uh, why you chose public administration for your PhD. Uh, yes, uh, you, after you get early promotions, uh, 
I ones usually have some kind of a management kind of twist to them. So that's how they, they, that I, cause I have a master's in, in uh, from Oklahoma also. And so that, that's how that started. And you think that you're going to turn out to be a manager or a CEO or something. Yes. And so you sort of switch over to do the management part of working with people and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot of students on the program and I'm going to try to combine a few questions um, that, that perhaps uh, are directly addressed to some of these students. We have students asking um, about um, how you dealt with it if you ever kind of ran into an obstacle or felt like you couldn't do something. Um, what, um, what did you draw on to, to make you feel better, to kind of push you past that sense of self-doubt? Yeah, I guess I think we always have some areas that are, that, that are hard to deal with. Um, I, 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 I guess I don't know if I should get into this, but I always felt like there was somebody uh, or something that was there for me, uh, that there was a unseen amount of help and support and all that you, you don't see, uh, but you feel it in your heart and you know it. And so when you have problems, you, you reach for that extra push that you need. And then you, you, your family it was all, all get together and, and help support each other. And, and all. So, uh, for some reason, I, I don't know, always, always, whatever mentors I had too, were always supportive and want to uplift you. Proceed for you. Um, would you um, make sure you're you're talking into your computer speaker? We couldn't hear that last thing you said. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And if if you maybe pull the computer a little closer to you, that could help yeah. too. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Push it a little closer. Okay. I, Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I always, I, I guess it's the word. There's always uh, the Almighty, I, I refer to him, as the big help uh, that you have to draw on. When, when nothing else seems to, 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 to uh, help, uh, you know, there is, there is another one. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we, um, we have time for maybe one more question. And um, uh, a couple people have, have hinted to this and um, it, it might be particularly apt to have someone like you, Dr. West, who has had such a, um, an amazing career, who has faced prejudice and discrimination and still uh, managed to, to persevere and succeed. Someone who has also um, been on this earth for um, uh, nine decades uh, and has witnessed incredible changes uh, in our society and, and historic events. Um, so from your perspective, what are some of your thoughts on the recent events of this past summer with the upsurge of racial justice protests and the recognition in America that even though we've made a lot of progress towards mm -hmm. racial equity, we still have more work to do. So um, as someone who is as experienced as you, um, we'd like to, to hear your thoughts on recent events like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. If, if, if you read that kind of thing, that's been happening all the time, all through life. And it, it sort of, un, unless starting from the point where we just stop on the, on the other question, uh, you, got, you got to have that almighty there, something that you know is stronger and bigger than we are. And every time we have some of these uprising and all, it seems like something happens, some, uh, some change or, or people 
understand better. And uh, some people are, uh, are helped by what just happened and, and so forth. And others are hurt and, and all. And it, to me, sometimes you feel like there has to be an uprising or something for people to uh, get a new idea or a new way of thinking about things. And uh, I always feel like that this end that something good comes out of all of the bad that happens and all. So I, I, I just feel that they will be taken care of. <laughs> all right. Well, that's a, a, a wonderful sentiment to add to end on. Um, well, I want to, on behalf of all of our participants, thank you, Dr. West, for sharing this evening with us, for sharing um, some of your insights and experiences from your remarkable life. I also want to thank all of our participants for joining us. Um, I apologize we didn't get to every question, but um, I hope in the variety of topics we discussed, um, we at least touched upon many of your questions. And um, uh, a final little plug, I wanna remind everyone that Dr. <laughs> West has a, a new autobiography where she goes into greater depth about some of her life and experience. So if you um, are keen to learn more about Dr. West, um, please, uh, uh, I hope you can get your hands on this really wonderful and engaging read. So again, Dr. West, thank you so much. And you. Uh, to our audiences, thank you too. Thank you. All right, well, everybody take care, please stay safe. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at the next VMHC program. Bye-bye now. Thank you.